However, um, he is going to take you out uh, a little later in his talk uh, to outside for those who will actually want to see it fly. And actually, I'll probably do that within the next two or three minutes because okay. once you've seen it fly, you'll think, it took him that long to get it to do just that? <laughs> and then I can spend the last 20 minutes of the talk telling you why. Yeah. Um, I don't have anything like the level of control I'd like to have. So, yes, be prepared to be um, disappointed and disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll set your, set your expectations low and then it can only get better. So, um, Phoebe just felt like giving her a name because I get fed up of calling her a quadricopter or a quadcopter. It's just too many syllables. There is to her not many bits, really. Most of this looks like off the shelf, but the, um, the yellow blob on the top, the yellow um, rectangle cube, whatever, on the top, is actually just a Raspberry Pi with a Pipo style case. Um, it's a Model A Raspberry Pi. And then basically just a breadboard on top to set a couple of sensors on. And the sensors are an accelerometer and um, a gyroscope. And that's it. The rest of the kit is basically just off the shelf for quadcopters where people just buy them off the shelf and fly them around with remote controls. To give you a quick run through, um, so you might not you might be aware of quadcopters and they've become a lot of boys' toys kind of things where you just just go and buy them and fly them. That wasn't my incentive. I wanted to know how they worked. I started from complete utter total ignorance, um, and it's taken me about 18 months to get to the stage where I am. Some of it's my fault, um, and I'll try and explain that later on. If you haven't seen one, if you haven't flown one, if or seen one on the TV or on YouTube or whatever. They use quite a lot. If any of you watch Country File on Sunday on BBC One, whenever you see an overhead view of a presenter, or you see something skimming across a, um, a cornfield, it's a quadcopter. It's not a helicopter anymore. Country File definitely have, um, have their own quadcopter, and they've basically got a two-man team, one flying it and one controlling a camera that's slung underneath it. So keep an eye out for it, certainly the one over the cornfield, you can actually see the shadow of the quadcopter moving along the right-hand side of the, of the TV frame, but you just had to watch out for it. Um, yes, as I've already said, keep your expectations low. So Phoebe, no remote control. She's basically completely autonomous. She's got a flight plan programmed into the code. Um, the flight plan is just a very simple three seconds take off, hover and descent. What you expect from that would be, what you'll see will be quite different and then I'll explain once we're all back in um, why that's the case. Um, and as I say, stand my back, be ready to run. You shouldn't need to run, basically if you all hang out by the soldering um, tent outside, just beyond it, and I'll go up onto the level um, area there and hopefully get it to perform in some level of behaviour that you think is cool rather than utterly crazy. Okay? Alright, if you can head out to the soldering area.
Oh, here we go. So, yeah. Now we don't have the motors powered up. I'm probably doing another test run. Just where it can have flashes. It's the lost connection. Oh, so, that was all I was typing in as part of the test flight, or all the parts of the flight we saw. Um, the whole, that first dump is a whole load of configuration parameters that I could tweak with as far as while I was doing any testing. Um, there's quite a lot of them, a lot of them are completely stable, which is why I didn't have to type any of them at the moment. So, that's probably one of the most important things, is try, the last pitch, is trying to actually measure gravity when she's sitting on unlevel and stable ground and work out what the real gravity value should be when she's horizontal. So you can see various zeros and ones. So the 0.99154 is kind of a measure of gravity on the tilt and then you <coughs> convert it to 1.0 or whatever. To work out where gravity is because she needs to know which way is up. And gravity is the only way that she can tell which way is up and which way is horizontal. Anyway, um, yeah, let's get on with the presentation side of things. And let's see where we got to. Okay, keep your expectations low. That was actually quite a good flight. I don't know if you caught it, um, all of it. Something happened when she came down, and there's a wire loose somewhere, which is why she didn't stop beeping when I tried that second run. Um, and that's why I wasn't willing to run the second run, because of this. if she doesn't stop beeping, it means one of the main connections to the motors is not connected properly, and at that point, the flight would have been, well, she'd have just broken basically, she'd have flipped over and hit her head. Right, quick run through the bits and pieces on the hardware side, propellers, motors. Um, the first thing of vague interest are these things called ESCs, electronic speed controllers, which they actually aren't. They're kind of a, they're a converter that takes a PWM pulse width modulation signal in and out goes, um, Basically, you've got a variety of H bridges, if you know what they are, um, inside it. Basically, powers the motors um, according to whatever the PWM signal is doing. So, there's a small microcontroller in there, basically running that. You just buy them off the shelf and you just use them. Beyond that, what have we got? Um, Raspberry Pi is actually doing everything else apart from that. So if you buy one of the ones off the wall or if you're off the shelf or if you go and look at most of the DIY ones, they've got Arduino kit running in there. And I really did not want to do, I wanted to make it as Pi unique as I could. I wanted to use as little of anything else that I could. I wanted it to be pure Python if I could because I write C day in, day out for work, and I wanted to do something that had absolutely nothing to do with work. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, that pretty much sums up what's going on in the yellow cube, well, in the yellow rectangle. Um, and yeah, it took me a while, but now the only thing that is not run on the Raspberry Pi are the actual sensors themselves. So there's a small sensor breakout, on the top, so the whole breadboard is essentially mostly just wires connecting things together. The only thing of any significance is the sensor that's in the middle of the dome and the four wires that's connecting the PWM signals out to the motors. Right, um, wake up you, it's not that boring. Wrong way. There we go, tell who wasn't concentrating enough. Um, yeah, and the whole thing other than the frame is actually just a combination of Velcro, blue tack and double-sided sticky tape to stick it together. Simply because then when you crash, it's easy to disassemble everything and rebuild it from scratch. Um, so yes. Software, I'm not going to go through the software in a whole lot of detail um, because it's tedious and I'll say something wrong and then you'll laugh. Um, this is kind of a diagram of how all the bits glue together to keep her roughly horizontal, roughly not drifting left right. Um, the round circles are 
a representation of what are called PIDs, and they basically take an input, so what the sensors are reading, um, a target, which is what you want it to do, um, and with some relatively simple, well, in fact, very simple maths, um, put out an output, which is what you are, what you want the motors to do as a result. So they don't, and basically it uses a feedback mechanism. In this horizontal case, there are two. There's one on the right hand side that just stops, has stability, so she doesn't jiggle, she doesn't flip over her head. And then the one in the middle is to do with velocities, um, so that in this particular case, the three steps of the flight plan are rise at 0.3 meters a second for three seconds, stay where you are, no, no movement on any of the left, right, and up frames for three seconds, and then descend for three seconds. So that middle one, the middle circle, is basically controlling speeds and then putting output into the right hand circle to say, right, okay. This is what I want you to do to correct my speed errors, and then the one on the right hand side controls stable rolling in directions to basically control what speed she's drifting left and right. So I don't know whether you saw, she did drift a bit, um, she did also try and then correct it, so she starts doing like this and then she swung back slowly, but um, at the same time there's underlying drifts that she doesn't try and correct. None of that's analog, that's all... That's all, so yeah, so the sensors, everything along the top of the diagram, basically where I'm men mentioning angles or acceleration and all that, so that all comes from the sensor unit that's on the, um, on the breadboard at the top. The actual sensors are analog, but inside, oh, yeah. but inside the thing, then there's two A to D, D converters and whatever, so that it's basically what the Raspberry Pi gets is an I2C connection um, to get the actual data. So you've got, you've got about two bytes of data for every sensor. So about six sensors, well there are six sensors in there. For and you've implemented the actual um, uh, control system itself down the bottom there, you've implemented that? That, that whole, Python. basically every part of that is written in Python. Um, and I, we could go through the code, and you could get very bored because it's um, it's not that interesting. But my aim was to get it done in Python, and the key bit there is primarily performance. It's getting Python to run fast enough, yeah. and all the components to run fast enough to actually make it achievable. What sort of update rate are you getting out of Python? So I am getting the code runs at about 450 loops a second, oh, okay. and each loop, have I got a loop? Oh, sorry. No, no, I actually, I don't, I don't think I'm, I was trying to avoid going through a loop, but essentially that diagram um, is a loop. So each one of the loops of the code, 450 times a second, reads all of the sensors and, and basically just averages them. In fact, it's integrating them because it's um, multiplying them by the time period since the last sensor read. Can you give us a description of the notation that you're using? Is that theta? And theta? So yeah, um, let's go. I'll happily do that. So basically, for the angles, um, I'm using the angle of it's a theta and it's an angle of tilt, mm -hmm. and you're measuring that angle of tilt. Um, you measure it in two different ways. The gyroscope. Um, you're basically sort of integrating, so that's what the, um, the sigma gyro d delta t is there for. It's essentially, it's integrating, but it, what it's actually doing is just 400 times a second reading the sensors, multiplying by the amount of time since it last read the sensor, and so adding it onto it. So t is going to be time, not t. That's, it's actually dt, which is the delta in time. So, yeah, um, so it's the time since you've read the sensor last time. So each time you read the sensor, you take a, a, a time um, a timestamp, and then when you read it next time, then you basically um, multiply those together, the timestamp times where it is now, and that takes a, that basically converts a gyro output, which is a rotation speed, into an actual angle 
that has changed since the last time you looked at it. So you're constantly integrating the gyro output to come up so with So the gyro to uh, delta to is always dynamic. Yes, yeah. And likewise, the accelerometer one, so when you've got the accelerometer, that's measuring acceleration, gravity plus any movement left, right, up or down. And if you don't have any acceleration other than gravity, then you can run the x, y, z axes and use a u, whoops, sorry folks, use a Euler angle calculation that basically churns out the angle of tilt in the same way that the gyro does. The difference is the gyro is good short term, but because you're integrating and you're not actually integrating, you're adding up, it'll eventually drift out of accuracy. Long term, the accelerometer Euler angles are great, they're perfect, but um, short term, they're picking up all sorts of noise from the motors, the propellers, so you can't use them short term because they spike all over the place, but if you average them out long term, then they're good. So they go through this filter basically that merges the two, uses the gyro short term, uses the accelerometer long term, and then those angles are for, used for various things to basically either detect tilt, uh, well, primarily to detect tilt, and therefore either decide whether that's the right level of tilt to correct something, or in fact whether that's a tilt that's an error and should be needs to be corrected in a different by then triggering an output from the um, from the pin code. I don't want to go into the pin code anymore because there's a presentation this afternoon on pit and robots, and they'll probably know it an awful lot better than I do and be able to present it a lot better than I can. Is that is that complementary filter? That's in the uh, the six o five o. No, it's not. No, no, okay. The, the MPU6050, which is the sensor unit, does come with a whole load of internal motion processing yes. code. Yes. I didn't want to use that, I wanted to understand how it all worked. So there's an awful lot of stuff that I'm not using in that um, inertial motion unit, the IMU, that I could have done. But I wanted to learn how these things worked, I wanted to work it all out for myself. And I wanted to work in Python, so no, everything is in my code. All I'm, all I'm reading is raw sensor data, that's it. Which is why it took me a year and a half to get to this stage, because I was just going through complete ignorance and trying to work there. You must be adding to the way that you're trying to use the by using the uh, breadboard, uh, yep. various bits and pieces. Yep. What was your reason for doing that? Initially, because it was a project under development, and if I soldered things on I was bound to get things wrong because I didn't know what I was doing. Um, and the breadboard. Surely that turns fast now. Maybe. It is, and in fact, I have um, another one underway with a that's going to be based on a uh, B plus, simply because that's the smallest thing. Well, it's got the better power usage. Um, it's got its own hat PCB that's going to be on there. I'll put the same circuit on there, but it'll be. And soldered on. And so yeah. Broadcasting using this video, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Um, right. I'm not sure how time's going. I've got a little bit. The main problem. So this is the key bit. Why did she drift? Why did she keep going up when she should have been descending? Um, and it's a few months ago. I would say it, it was a bug in my coat. Now I am pretty adamant that it is not, and that it's simply down to the sensors themselves. So, critically, the accelerometer that's measuring how fast she's accelerating upwards and sideways um, has got about two, one or two percent accuracy, or critically one or two percent error in the accuracy. Um, it also, that's as far as scaling is concerned. It also can be offset by a certain amount as well, and there's about 1 or 2 percent error in that. And when you're using it to calculate the speed that she's moving, so she's sitting on the table like this, if the sensors are inaccurate, then the sensors may actually be feeding in that she's moving. And that's where you then start to get problems. So if she's, as I said, if she's sitting like that, but thinks she's moving, 
say forwards, <coughs> then when she actually lifts into the air, she's going to try and compensate for that movement forwards that she perceives is going on, which is suddenly start dashing backwards. Um, so I've ended up, I've gone through hoops to get the calibration as best I can by basically sticking the Raspberry Pi and the sensors into a clear cube. You just kind of turn it around all six axes, read the measurements, try and average them out and whatever. What you saw is the best result of that because also the readings drift by temperature. So I did that indoors yesterday. Today the temperature outside is different. So all of the calibration I did is now all slightly off. And what was yesterday a perfect flight, today has drifted. Um, getting towards the end, don't worry. So, yeah, you're talking about, you're asking about loop speeds and things like that. Um, so the main, as I've said, the main loop runs around hard, as fast as it can, just reading the sensors. Um, I've decided arbitrarily that then, having averaged or integrated the sensors over, you know, uh, 400 times, 450 times a second, about every 40th of a, sec a second, I update the data to the motors, basically. Kind of figures that if you think, she weighs a kilo and a half as it is, you know, she's only got props on the corners, she's not moved, you know, she's wobbling like this, you don't really need updates of any real significance, and so essentially that gives me the possibility to take, to average out the sensors and take out the noise that comes from the motors, the vibrations from the motors and the propellers, and just feed in, fingers crossed, more accurate values. Um, when I started doing that probably a year ago, maybe more, I was only getting about 100 loops a second, and I've had to go through all sorts of um, bits and bobs just to get the timings up, and sometimes they've been quite, quite amazing, the, the kind of speed advantages you can get. I think probably the best, looking at the list, was actually calling time.time. .time. So you need, to, you need to know the time that you read the sensors. And I've got other places I needed in the code to know the time. And previously I was just calling time lots of different times wherever I needed to know it. I called it just once at the top of each loop. And then just used that value everywhere else in the code. That actually more than doubles the speed. So there's an irony that actually finding out your time takes more time than you actually <laughs> wanted to do. Um, the rest are all just bits and bobs. Um, but yeah, I got it from probably 100 hertz, time on time sorts of doubled it up to 200. Um, some data reading probably took a, a lot off. The next most significant one was I ended up having to, I rewrote a little bit of the GPIO code to speed that up to be, to be able to catch data as soon as it was available rather than having to wait for it by just sitting spinning. So what next? Um, yeah, I've already mentioned so I'm going to um, rebuild the body, use a pipe, uh, B plus um, Raspberry Pi. I'm going to change it to a PCB so it's more solid because basically when she hits the ground, wires tend to fall out and that's probably what has happened um, on that second flight just then. Um, more to the future though, is to get those sensors better. Mm. Um, can't do a lot, a great deal about the gyro and the accelerometer. They are just about as good as they come. I can sort out the height with the a barometer, which is basically just measuring the air pressure. You can get ones that are fine enough to read 10 cent, basically air pressure differences over, say, 10 centimeters. So that if you want to rise to a height of a meter, you're going to get just a 10 percent error on that. So that would be better for vertical climbing speeds. I really have no idea what I can do about horizontal. Um, the only real, because you need to have real motion detection, about the only option um, you can either buy off the shelf films at about 100 quid, which is way too more than you know, what I'm doing anyway, rather than do it by myself if there's a way. The other way is to use the Rusty Cam um, to take videos of the floor that she's flying over, and part of the graphics processing to get one frame in a video to the next one is to actually know which way one frame of a video has moved to generate the next one 
and out of the GPU on the Raspberry Pi comes a whole bunch of vectors that say this frame move this direction to go to the to go to the next frame, and that information is could then be used as a motion tracking system, so that as you're videoing, videoing the grass that she's flying over, she could detect um, the GPU could detect changes in the um, in the picture that the video is taking, and this therefore the see that it's moving that way. This is grass rather uniform. Depends on the resolution of your video, doesn't it? Um, I don't know, I haven't tried this, this is just more speculation at the moment. I'm hoping for us is suitable. But we do have a lot of weed to have, so actually, if you're right. Um, yeah, the only other things I can do by adding a magnetometer to compass, I'll be have a much better idea of where she's pointing. So at the moment I've just I've got a bit of code that stops her rotating around so it's your is the name of the rotation, but there's a bit of codes preventing the yaw, which means that she keeps pointing in the same direction, and I, don't, I just don't worry about it at the moment. But if you had a compass, then you could make her deliberately turn where you want her to go. You said you were getting a lot of noise on the sensors. Have you tried like mechanically dampening the sensors so they don't pick up? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, what have we got? We've got the yellow box is double sided foam sticky taped. Right. onto the main frame. The breadboard is then on rubber standoffs um, onto the Raspberry Pi, so there's a double level of physical separation. But I think fundamentally, um, probably doesn't help that the motors are there and the main noise is going to be coming from the propellers and the sensor is at exactly that height. Mm. But that was just a I ran out of, there's no space underneath because that's stuffed full of batteries. Um, I didn't want it anywhere down here because of the way she crashes flat at hard down onto the ground. So that was the best I could do. And that's part of the reason actually for getting her onto a B plus. Because I can get that, I can get the circuitry down inside the case. I can get it below the main blades, the main propeller blades, and therefore reduce the, um, hopefully reduce the noise levels as well. But I think by the, I think by using the averaging, and only feeding the motors by every you know, tenth of the number of samples. Um, that had a significantly biggest improvement, and my main problem now is simply that the sensors are not accurate enough. Surely it's electrical noise that you have suffered with, not audible noise. Now that would be the case until a few months ago. So, yes, electrical noise, I actually had problems with the dropping out of the sky because if there was a sudden change, you'd get a huge current boost from the big lithium battery there, mm. that, the voltage drop from that would then not be enough to power the Pi and she'd reboot. And yes, there was electrical noise as well driving the sensors. <coughs> I had got a regulator in there, but not enough. Which is why now, she, there's the big power one there, but there's also a little phone charger battery there running quite independently and hopefully noise free because it's just, a, you know, it's just another phone charger job. Um, I was going to say, but you're re reading these sensors, you know, as you read them faster and faster, the actual noise increases. So yes, you can actually um, work against it's yourself. A, it's, it's, a, and it's not actual, linear in any way. I think the way the chip works, obviously it's an analog to digital converter. I think the conversion speed, the rate of the actual um, converter is fixed and then you can sample the data from that at a given rate. And so, um, and then there are internal filters, digital filters to actually limit noise from that. So I'm pulling data off the sensors at about a kilohertz, so faster than my code can run. Um, Do you have to use uh, analog to digital or not digital to digital? I don't use analog to digital, but it's the chip itself that um, I think the actual sensors are analog, what they are. Um, so it then, it then basically uses a 16-bit analog to digital in all syntaxes, essentially three for the gyro and three for the um, accelerometer. Are you looking at it today to live on the... Yes, um, certainly when I was doing my, until testing very recently, and I'm talking weeks, a week or few, few ago, um, yes, I was logging absolutely everything. So not only the data, but the interpretation of the code at every step along its operation. Um, 
um, that slows her loop speed down from about 440 to about 390 something. So she's still flyable at that. The only problem it gives is you get, you read a whole bunch of sensors, you sort them out, you've passed them out to the motors, and then you write the logs. And in writing the logs, that takes time, and it knocks, it makes it just ever so slightly more unstable. I've done things like sort of logs are written to shared memory and only dumped at the end of flight so you get fast, fast writing <coughs> to a shared memory file. Um, I've locked her code in um, so that she can't be um, shared, you know, sent to disk and then dragged back from disk. The code is permanently locked um, in memory. And it's all right, it's good enough. I'm getting to the point where I can't use the diagnostics anymore because they affect. It's the Schrodinger's cat thing. If I, if I look at the diagnostics, I, if I, then it changes the way she flies. So it's, it's real. It's getting to the point where it's gut feel and you know, guesswork. Gut feel and guesswork. Try some. Sorry? You've done the nine o'clock? No. No. No, simply because 10% is neither here nor there. I've gained 400. I've gained. 400% by right. just fixing the code, so... I found the Pi does take really well to overclock it. And you does can, it? You can print some of the ones, the memory ones, you can double quite easily and it still runs fine. So right, it what's out. the memory one? It kind of runs at 750 megahertz um, as, as standard, as yes. a block standard. And you can certainly take it up to close to 1 gig. Right. And I think I'm running... It's like more than 10%. Yeah, I'm running yeah, a gig five hundred, five hundred, I think. Is that the common one? Something like that. But I've, I've not had a flight crash yet from doing it. Really? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not from doing that, but um, the only issues that I've heard about that result from running it at, I think the maximum is about nine hundred and fifty meg. Right. Um, is that it somehow affects the SD card. Right. I'm not so sure if that's true on the B plus. Yeah, that's when I find the thing that's going to fail first when you're overclocking is the SD card. So if right. you're running on with memory, you'll probably be fine. If you're trying to log data, you well, might. The, the log only happens at the end of the flight anyway. So either when, yeah. they, when I hit Control C yeah. or a flight ends. That would give me more flight time as well. Sorry. That would give me more flight time. Because you're logging it all into memory and then doing the dump up. It, it does, but at the moment, as you've seen from the test flight, a 10 second flight is perfectly, <laughs> is perfectly long to, to work to see errors and work what? out what's going on. And I've reached the stage now. I, yes, I Luke. Luke. Me near all that time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's kind of like, it, it's. And it's not long. <laughs> no, it's, but until I can work out ways to improve yeah. the or to replace the accelerometer as my main motion controller. Mm. Um, I don't think anything more than 10 second flight is actually viable. Mm. Um, you mm. know, I could try it, well, there are better ways I can do calibration and I've done it before, but I um, ran out of time for this, pro for this presentation to actually do it. So I could probably get it a little bit better, but I've got no insight. My, my aim was not to produce a toy to play like that. My aim was to understand how these things work. So even if I don't actually ever get it to be any better than it is, mm. it's still a success as far as I'm concerned because mm. I know what's going on. Are you planning on this being autonomous all the time? Yes. Right. This was purely a project. Okay, to give you a very, how are we doing for time? Is that orange? Yes. Yeah. Which means? Oh, you've got about five minutes. That's fine. So, <laughs> like I said, I started from complete ignorance. I thought that autonomous was a, a, an easy step to go before you then add a joystick and a human being on the end. I got it completely the wrong way around, and I only actually realised that a couple of months ago. So if you buy them off the shelf, the set of pits that you've got set up are completely different. Um, you'll still have the one on the right hand side, you still need stability, um, so that when it's been told to stay at a, go to a given angle, it stays there. The difference is that one in the middle, I've got that based on horizontal on speed. So it's detecting speed and trying to undo any speed that is not part of the target. So if you're aiming at hover stable, any speed it detects that way, it needs to tilt that way to get it back where it's going. The ones off the shelf don't have that, they're just based on angles. 
So you, you basically, the remote control is setting angles. Um, so that middle one is basically you're just saying, I'd like you, as you push the joystick, and then as you change the remote control and fiddle with the joysticks, it goes around like that. And the last, so basically, the person doing the horizontal speed pit is a human being in the feedback loop of actually watching the quadcopter fly, spotting the feedback against what it actually wants to do, and tweaking the joysticks to actually make it work. I thought that would be hard, and so I thought, I know, I'll put motion control in there instead. And that's what, well, I didn't, I went from complete ignorance, I don't know, I've been on this. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and actually, uh, again, that Python I knew wasn't an ignorant decision, I knew it would be a challenge, and that's why I did it. Um, and actually, Python is working well enough. The sensors are, you know, the code is fast enough. Um, simply the, I'm now down to the accuracy of the sensors, and probably my next step um, is to try and get my best calibration possible, which involves, as I say, this clear Perspex cube that I glue the Raspberry Pi or use double sided sticky tape to stick inside, and then I can rotate her around her axes and measure the, the offsets and gains and sensors. And a beer fridge, um, because then I can do that at a known temperature, and then I can do it at, say, a room temperature or a nice warm temperature, and then the errors in the um, sensors are approximately linear, so that you can calibrate, so that basically as she runs, she can calibrate the accurate values for the sensors based upon the current temperature, which she can read, Anyway, and then apply the maths to basically come to this to, um, to come up with whatever the accurate values of the errors are. So, by the sense of it, what you want is a, a table of. Um, it's easier because, it, because, because it's because it's linear. You can actually do it as just an equation. Um, in fact, I've done it before in the past, but I wasn't careful enough to do it. Is there it. no way to have sort of self calibration? Do you need GPS for that? Um, I have actually got some self calibration, but it's sort of. If you're, if she's. Well, you'll have to imagine, because of the rubber balls, she's leaning on the table. Um, what, you, what you're trying to do is you've got. The only force of like that before takeoff is gravity. Um, so you can't do an exact gravity. Can we do an exact gravity measurement? Yeah. Because of the offset in the sensors, you can't just say, well, the vertical measurement I've got is gravity. And because of the tilt she's at, you can't say the vertical offset she's got is gravity. You need to account for the angle, which you can only obtain from the accelerometer. So you're using known floor values to read a better value. So I've had a go, I've had a go at kind of iterating around that to get the the angles better and then read gravity better. And actually she's running that code during that test, so she it was a pre-calibrate, it was an iterative gravity calculation. And it improved things, but at the, the amount I'm using that acceleration, I need the accelerometer, I need it to be as accurate as possible. And yeah, I mean, can you can you experiment with the complementary filters to change the crossovers on them to see if, if some of your errors are, are being injected from the filters, or the, or the selection of cut-off frequency on those filters. That is it, yes, you're absolutely right. I have the complement, the, well, there's both complementary filters, um, which are filtering out noise from the angles. Yeah. There's also filters within the sensors themselves. Yeah. Um, that filter the raw data from the sensors. Yeah, that's and yeah, an awful lot of this, an awful lot of my testing has been, you know, essentially juggling yeah. the sensor outputs and the filters that are being applied and just trying to guess what the right values are. Yeah. And yes, it's been a, yeah. it's been an awful lot of guessing, Probably. an awful lot of crash, it crashes into brick, uh, brick walls as a result. <laughs> so, um, yes. It's a red card there. <laughs> I'm being sent off. <laughs> it's a good time. We're going to get a, a few minutes break for the next uh, talk, but I think that was a, a really interesting talk. Very, uh, very good demonstration. <laughs>